Good evening. I hope you'll excuse all this, but I've been taking some time off from my job to look into something important to all of us that seems to be pretty well confused. What I mean is missiles, high-performance airplanes. Why do we have so many? Why do we need both? Where are we going with all this? A fellow asked me that question in London not very long ago. You know, it's not a simple question. And I couldn't give him a simple answer, and that's the reason for all this homework. It seems to me that we've got to understand just what we're building, how each of these missiles and airplanes add to our deterrent strength, and why we've developed them, and what they do. Now, I'd like to tell you what I wish I'd been able to tell that fellow in London not very long ago. Some of you may remember, I was a bomber pilot in World War II. That was back when the Air Force inventory was a relatively simple one. There were long-range, heavy bombers like this one. I flew one of these, old B-24. As a matter of fact, this is some of my handiwork as a model airplane builder. I know the kids make them out of plastic nowadays. This is the old-fashioned wood type. I had a lot of sandpaper on this. This is my group tail marking. It's a black background, horizontal white stripe. They, uh, they called us truck drivers, the fighter pilots did. Well, these were the trucks that delivered the payload back in those days when the Air Force concept of strategic bombing was first being applied. And it worked pretty well. Of course, we needed fighter support in order to get through. These fighters, they were sort of like traffic cops who cleared the way for us to Berlin, Hamburg, Essen, Cologne. And sometimes it took some clearing. But whether these fighters fought aggressive actions or defensively as interceptors shooting the other fellow down before he could strike at us, their role was clear. They were fighters, and they fought. There were other airplanes, too. Medium bombers like this B-25, carrying lighter loads a shorter distance than we drove our liberators in flying forts. And there were tactical aircraft used in support of ground operation, used as artillery by the infantry. But no matter how many aircraft types and models we had then, it was easy to understand what each was for. How all of them worked together to knock the enemy out of the air, pound them out of the war. But now, it doesn't seem that simple anymore. Years have passed, times have changed. Uh, they changed quite a bit, as a matter of fact. Now we have missiles, and yet we still have airplanes. New aircraft, high-performance jets. And you're, you're tempted to think that one or the other might be able to do the job alone. Airplanes without missiles, or missiles without airplanes. Now, hundreds and hundreds of words have been written about deterrence and air defense and SAC and nuclear weapons and the ballistic missile versus the manned and expensive bomber. But unless you're a very careful reader and have time to think things through, the only real clear idea you're liable to get is just that you're confused because there are just too many names. Mace, Matador, Quail, F-100, B-58, Sidewinder, Thor, F-102, Snark and Atlas, F-104, F-105, F-106, Beaumark, Titan, Jupiter and F-101, air-to-air -air missiles, air-to-ground, ground-to-air, ground-to-ground. Why so much? What's it all for? How do all these weapons work together to defend the United States and deter an enemy attack? Well, I'll tell you. That is, I'll try to tell you. Now, let's begin with the heavy bomber, because I'm a little familiar with these. Now, this B-52 is essentially what the long-range heavy bomber was in World War II, only more so. It's faster, goes a lot farther, carries a heavier payload, too. With more destructive power in one B-52 than you could haul in all the B-17s, B-24s we had in 1944. Because times have changed. And the bomber's speed and its altitude have been greatly increased. This B-58 flies higher and faster than any bomber we've ever had. It has to. 
because they've also increased the speed and the range and the altitude capability of the counter weapons that can knock a heavy bomber down, weapons comparable to our own F-104, or any ground-to-air or air-to-air -air intercept missile or rocket the other side might have. In fact, that's what war is all about. It's always the same old story of action and counteraction of a new weapon designed to catch the enemy off guard and a second new weapon to counteract the first. Every aircraft and every missile we have today has been developed within this pattern to prepare or to meet some new unexpected weapon. Now look at this B-52 again. Fast as she is and high as she flies, this bomber, or even the later B-58, is conceivably vulnerable to interception or to ground-to-air weapons defending its assigned target area. Therefore, some of our bombers are armed with weapons that both extend their range and increase their capability of self-defense by enabling them to avoid these heavily defended targets. Launched from altitude, these supersonic air-to-surface guided missiles can carry a nuclear warhead many hundreds of miles, impacting with accuracy. Now that means hitting the target right on the nose from relative safety several hundred miles away. And you know what that means to the men on these bomber crews. It means a good percentage of them are gonna stand a good chance of getting home. And you wanna remember how important these crewmen are to us. Now consider this though. Intercontinental ballistic missiles are built to do exactly what long range bombers are built to do to carry a heavy payload to a target hundreds or thousands of miles away. So why use, why use the bomber? Why risk any of these men? Why not use the missile and let it go at that? A long range or intercontinental ballistic missile has one big advantage over manned aircraft. You can get it up in a matter of minutes and racing toward the target as long as you're sure you want it to go where it's going and do what it has to do. But you can't call it back. And you can't change its course. Now the SAC commander can closely direct the flight of every single man bomber in the air, night and day, around the clock. SAC headquarters knows where every one of its bombers is. Each individual aircraft, flights of three or more squadrons, wings, an air force, or the whole command can be deployed as any specific enemy threat develops. And once launched, the whole attack can be diverted or else aborted or called off. That's what the pilot adds to your defense. That priceless flexibility and the further capability no missile has of seeking out targets that aren't precisely known or can't be pinpointed on a map. With his added ability to observe and to think about what he sees and knows and to make a decision based on all of the evidence he has, the pilot is your best guarantee that there won't be any mistakes. But if the chips are down, he and his crew are there to deliver the load. And yet, the missiles are there to back them up. Long-range strategic missiles already fired down the entire 5,000-mile missile test range, successfully fired. Some of them already in the Air Force inventory, some of them soon to be, and others coming along, projected, planned, designed, incorporating everything we've learned from every missile we've designed and built. Here's one we've already got, launched by rocket engines developing tons of thrust and millions of horsepower within seconds, Imparting speeds faster than 10,000 miles an hour, this weapon throws a nuclear warhead more than 5,000 miles with accuracy. But this is only an evolutionary step toward the more effective missiles we'll have a few short years from now. And yet, even though we have the ICBM, we still have the B-47 jet bomber, probably our best known intermediate range carrier. And I think one of the finest airplanes ever built. For the last six or seven years, the B-47 has been the all-around workhorse of the Strategic Air Command, capable of delivering nuclear weapons from the perimeter of our defensive line, from the bases of NATO and other allied countries to almost any target we might have to strike. And just as the ICBM blends with the long-range manned bomber, there are intermediate-range ballistic missiles supporting the B-47. 
Operational missiles successfully fired 1,500 miles or more, with which we and our allies can pose an additional effective counter threat along that same perimeter defended by the manned B-47 now. But right here, it begins to get more complex because there are other missiles working with our aircraft too. It's not just a question of having a long-range bomber and an intercontinental ballistic missile or having a B-47 and an intermediate-range missile too. These weapons alone aren't enough to guarantee survival. Now, let's look at that long-range bomber again and see what it takes to get it through to the target now. Because it's big enough to carry auxiliary equipment and crew, this bomber has a good chance of survival at any operating altitude. The crew can select the best altitude and tactics for penetrating enemy defenses and put the load exactly where they want it to go. This auxiliary equipment includes diversionary missiles like this one that we can drop or launch from the air to expose, decoy, or destroy ground weapons. Now this diversionary or countermeasures missile is a strategic weapon just like man bomber of the ICBM. They all work together to get the payload through and knock the enemy out of the war. Now that's SAC's role in the Air Force mission today, but that's just part of the story. Jet airplanes, ICBMs, have put the United States well within range of oh, almost anybody that would want to take a crack at us. Now SAC's deterrent force, its long range capability has so far prevented that. It's Air Defense Command's responsibility to make sure that if the other fellow decides to come on over, he won't get through. When any unidentified flying object enters our radar net, the air defense system is at once alerted. The fighter interceptor scrambles to make a positive identification of the suspect. If it's a hostile intruder, the pilot notifies the defense commander and attacks. Other fighter interceptor aircraft are then scrambled out so that maximum attrition may be brought to bear on the attacking force before the enemy can get within range to release its air-to-surface missiles and decoys. The old machine gun and the 275 rocket with which interceptors were armed in World War II are obsolete now. Today, these aircraft carry missiles like this one, either a beam rider or an infrared homing missile, or this one here, another infrared homing or target-seeking guided missile. Or this one. Some consider it the best of all these air launch missiles. This is actually a rocket with an atomic warhead, a highly effective defensive weapon. But if the attacking force still penetrates within range, our surface-to-air missiles then take over the brunt of the attack. This interceptor missile a key ADC weapon is a dependable and accurately guided Mach 3 missile with an effective range up to 200 miles. It will have a 400 mile capability in the near future. Now, in addition to having this range, it's a real good weapon up at those altitudes where fighter aircraft can't operate too well. Control provided by SAGE centers enables employment of both fighter interceptors and surface -to air missiles in the same airspace. So you see, this missile and the fighter employed as an interceptor are complementary to each other in defending us against air attack. Now that's the Air Defense Command story today. But there's one other area of Air Force responsibility, tactical air. Now, while it's very essential in a general war, tactical air is particularly tailored for local or small wars. During 1958, the Composite Air Strike Force, the firemen of the U.S.-based tactical air forces, deployed to the Middle East and Far East in support of our national policy. In the Lebanese situation, F-100D aircraft flew non-stop with night in-flight refueling from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, to Adana, Turkey in a little over 12 hours. The tactical fighter is a multi-purpose weapon. It delivers nuclear weapons by dive bombing straight down into the target, by toss bombing, and by what the trade calls over-the-shoulder bombing. The tactical fighter also has an air superiority mission, using homing missiles to gain this superiority. And it has a key ground support role, 
in land battles to contain the numerically superior forces of an enemy. There are tactical missiles, too, that blend with or support tactical aircraft. This one, for instance, electronically controlled from the ground, it can travel five or 600 miles at an altitude of 35,000 feet to carry either a conventional or nuclear warhead deep into enemy territory. A number of tactical missile groups armed with this weapon are already deployed in Europe and incidentally one on Formosa. Uh, what's it called? Well, I've deliberately avoided calling any of these weapons by name because there are so many of them. You've heard not only about ICBMs and IRBMs, but about GAR-1 and GAM-77 and IM-99 and TM-76, SM-75. And then you've heard these same weapons called Falcon and Hound Dog and Bowmark and Matador and Thor, and it's all just helped to add to the confusion. Because why so many? Why are there sometimes two, maybe even three different kinds of a particular missile type? Why Atlas and Titan and Minuteman too? Why is there Snark and Thor and Jupiter? Aren't they all ICBMs, IRBMs? That's right, they are. They are, but they're related. They're, they're, not, they're not identical triplets or twins. Each of these weapons represents a new generation in the telescope years through which we've lived since 1954. Now, some are good, some better, a few not very good at all anymore because they've been made obsolete. But each one of them, each one of them was the best weapon we could develop for a specific purpose at the time each of these missiles was designed and engineered. And taking all of them together, each of these weapons has been, and many of them still are, important bricks in the defensive wall with which up until now we've managed to keep the peace. But if this is the answer today, missiles and aircraft blending together, complementing each other, where do we go from here? What weapon systems will we be using five, ten years from now? Over what ranges and at what speeds and altitudes will we have to defend ourselves then? Is it possible that maybe a low-flying, slow-moving, atomic-powered, manned airplane might set aside all these high-flying, fast-moving missiles and planes we're building now? Maybe. Maybe. Although it, it sounds like a bomber pilot's dream. Maybe a plane like that would only plug one more gap in the free world's defensive wall. Because maybe the trend five years from now will still be up. You know, that's the way it's always been. Ever since this, I didn't build this one. This is too tough. But this is a model of the Wright Brothers airplane, the one they flew back in Kitty Hawk, 1903. And ever since then, the trend has been up to increasing speed, at increasing altitude, to flying higher and farther and faster than the other one. But right about here, in the early days of World War II, when flights above 10, 15,000 feet first became commonplace, we encountered something new. Because of the thinning out of the air, pilots and crewmen first began to take their own ground level atmosphere along with them. But the race for speed and altitude went on. And for quite some time now, the military aircraft has been a sealed vehicle traveling at altitudes at which man can't normally survive without wearing special clothes and without bringing oxygen along with him. Not slowly, but almost by leaps and bounds, this aircraft has been evolving toward a true spacecraft. Because what is space? Or what's the difference between air and space? Where does air, in which the Air Force has always worked, come to an end? And where does space begin? Maybe there isn't any difference between them. Maybe, except for the thinning out of the Earth's atmosphere, air and space are the same thing. Maybe, as far as flight is concerned, Air Force crews have been making space or space equivalent flights ever since they first left their natural habitat back 1942, 43. Now, if that's true, today's high-performance jet aircraft is more than ever a spacecraft. This morning's flight of an Air Force bomber crew at speeds in excess of Mach 1 and at altitudes over 60,000 feet 
is really very much like the experience men will have on their first flights in tomorrow's true spacecraft. And the day of that first true space flight isn't very far away either. For as we go racing into the future, the airplane and the ballistic missile come closer and closer together, each one evolving toward the ideal long-range weapon system combining the advantages of both. One, you can get right off the ground at maximum speed and up to altitude, but also one that you can divert or else recall. You give this experimental airplane the speed and altitude the missile has, or put this cockpit or control panel detached in its blockhouse now, put that back into the missile's airframe, and then give the pilot the equipment he needs to withstand acceleration and heat, and to overcome weightlessness of zero gravity. You lick these problems, and a few more like them, and you won't have a man and a missile. You'll have an Air Force pilot in a spacecraft. Man will be in space. And that may happen a whole lot sooner than we think it will. Because space is, for us, what the unknown land once was, the uncharted sea. A place into which all of man's history, everything he is, and all that he's ever been and done compels him to move. He has no choice. And, like the explorers of the past, he may have to fight up there. And that's why the Air Force has to do what it's always had to do. Get up higher and go faster than the other fellow. Because war, if it comes, it'll not confine itself to air, but it'll expand into the billions of space miles surrounding. That's, that's the only way it all makes sense. Missiles and airplanes both defending us today and manned spacecraft tomorrow. Now, I don't know whether I've answered all the questions we started out with. Why so many weapons? What are they for? What are we doing with this big force? I think we're buying more than the aircraft and the missiles we've been talking about. I think we're buying peace. I think we're investing in the future by deterring war. We have to, because, well, look here. The lights are on in my house tonight. My wife and children are asleep upstairs, and we've got to keep it that way. Lights burning, children asleep, and peace and security everywhere. <laughs>